Hello and welcome everybody um, to this CPS Fringe Events at Conservative Party Conference on the role of hydrogen uh, in the future. Uh, this event is actually building on some work that the CPS has done in the past in partnership um, with Rise Hydrogen, uh, including a report called Driving Change, um, which came out earlier this year. Um, I think we are all agreed that the government's ambitious goal to help us reach net zero by 2050 is one that we um, all need to maintain a focus on during this time of crisis coronavirus with all the other distractions. Um, and so I'm absolutely delighted that we have this panel convened today. Um, and not least that we are joined by uh, Nadine Zahawi, who is a Minister for Business and Industry, uh, Andrew Griffith, who is a recently elected Member of Parliament and the former business advisor in number 10, uh, Joe Bamford, who is a pioneer in the, in the field of hydrogen uh, as founder and executive chairman of RISE Hydrogen. Uh, and finally, Robert Colville, the Centre Policy Studies Director uh, and Sunday Times columnist. Um, I'm Emily Duncan. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at the CPS. Um, we're going to open up the discussion uh, with the Minister and I will hear opening remarks from all of our panellists, after which time we will have a, a little bit of a chat uh, and make sure we leave plenty of time for questions from the audience. So please do start submitting your questions. Um, I will try and get through as many of them as I can. Uh, but now I will hand over to the Minister for his opening remarks. Nadine. Thank you very much, Emily. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, well, yeah. I've had a few glitches today with my technology. Uh, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's good to join uh, uh, the panel. Um, both Joe and, and Andrew are people I've uh, uh, known and, and, and respect and really looking forward to Robert's contribution as well, thinking about hydrogen. Although it does feel like a bit of a moment because if I tell you this is the third uh, hour of uh, panels uh, where uh, the other two were more generalist, but very quickly got on to uh, the subject of hydrogen. Uh, this is obviously much more specific. Uh, clearly, there is you know, hydrogen is having its moment, or, or, or at least hopefully many moments. Um, both my department and the Committee on Climate Change have identified uh, low carbon hydrogen as one of this handful of uh, critical technologies to drive uh, to net zero by 2050. Uh, uh, and I have to tell you, that legislation has truly been a uh, a game changer I, you know, i've been in the house now for 10 years uh, and uh, i've sort of been outside of government in the, on the select committees and, and inside government for about three years uh, the way the machine has sort of cranked up the moment that became the law of the land is pretty incredible uh, across government whether it's mhclg or transport or of course at, at base and i think it's a, you know the potential uh, for hydrogen, uh, uh, not just to decarbonize heavy industry, but also uh, in terms of uh, you know its flexibility to, to be deployed across heating, energy, and transport, is what is exciting. It's been around for a long time, but I think you know if you go to the investment markets today with a hydrocarbon investment, you probably won't get. Uh, uh, financed, or you'll get financed at sort of very high interest rates. Whereas if you go with with uh, anything to do with clean growth, uh, at hydrogen, then 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 the money is gushing at very very competitive rates, which I think is making a difference. Why industry uh, is beginning to focus very much on the hydrogen opportunity. Uh, uh, but the other reason, obviously, uh, that hydrogen is clearly compatible uh, with the UK's current. I think 280,000 kilometer network of gas pipes, uh, it would absolutely save us the need uh, for significant amounts of new costly infrastructure. If we can get, say, 20% of our uh, uh, gas into homes to be hydrogen and then begin to build that up where you get industry to, to see that as an opportunity. I know Bosch and others have produced hydrogen boilers, but once they see that commitment from government, then they begin to see uh, the opportunity. And that begins with a strategy. But before I talk about the strategy, I think it's just worth sort of highlighting that we've done some, uh, what I would call, um, modest uh, investments and sort of toes in the water when it comes to hydrogen projects across the country. You know, Hynet in the Northwest got seven and a half million, Acorn in Scotland, 4.7 million, and of course, Gigastack in the Humber, seven and a half million. But all of that, it's fair to say, is, uh, uh, you know, 
a toe in the water. This, this is that is not a comprehensive joined up strategy for hydrogen that's been lacking uh, up to now. What I'm pleased to say is that not only will we have the energy white paper that will come out uh, in the autumn, so we're, we're, we are in the autumn now, so it's pretty imminent. It was supposed to come out in March. Obviously, COVID delayed it, but we are almost there. And uh, people, industry, businesses, stakeholders will begin to see uh, that roadmap to net zero by 2050. My very strong advice to my officials has been, you know, you can't legislate for 30 years out, but you certainly can make decisions for the next decade. Make sure those decisions are then delivered and then you flex for the decade after and you flex again for the final decade as you get to net, net zero. So following that um, uh, energy white paper, very hot on its heels will be the creation of uh, uh, the uh, of delivery, I should say, of the hydrogen uh, strategy. The Hydrogen Advisory Council that's been set up by my uh, brilliant colleague, Kwasi Kwerteng, is there to help inform that strategy so we can deliver it. I'm hoping first quarter of 2021. And the strategy will be, I think, one, an in incredibly important moment in terms of people, investors, industry, seeing the direction of travel and the ambition around uh, hydrogen to push forward to uh, uh, net zero. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I, I guess you know, most people on this panel will know that you know, it, it, it will deliver uh, a big upside for the economy uh, based the report on this energy innovation needs assessment uh, uh, where the, you know, the, the report modestly thinks hydrogen will be a 3.5 billion uh, injection into the economy creating about 50,000 jobs uh, Bloomberg uh, in May estimated that the world hydrogen project pipeline be worth about 90 billion um, Barclays did some research which indicates a sort of hydrogen market will be about a trillion by 2050. Uh, wouldn't it be fantastic if the uh, uh, that market was actually uh, in the city of London, where we clearly have, have done phenomenally well over many decades with hydrocarbons and having some of the biggest uh, 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 traders base themselves in the United Kingdom and the market very much, uh, uh, you know, have a sort of a, an anchor in the UK. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could do the same thing uh, with hydrogen? Uh, I think I will stop there. I look forward to uh, our discussion. A lot of very you know, uh, 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 excellent uh, panellists who will have very much their own take on this. They've been doing a lot of thinking about this. So thank you very much indeed again, Emily, for having me. Thank you, uh, Nadim. And I will go now to Andrew for, for his opening remarks, please. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, look, delighted to be here. Um, the CPS is a wonderful organisation that's still at the heart of formulating policy and goodness me we've never been in more need of forward-looking uh, great opportunities like hydrogen in the UK as we come out of this pandemic um, and as we forge our new way in the world having um, opened up uh, a whole panoply of options uh, it's really important to me that we come forward and match that ambition with a set of very practical strategies uh, to allow the UK to move forward. Um, and hydrogen is one of those. It sits alongside, to me, uh, a couple of other commanding heights of the new future economy, uh, where we've got all of the right advantages to succeed as a, as a nation. Things like uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, the life sciences, where we see uh, day by day how our, un our universities our basic research, but also some of our biggest companies in the world are absolutely at the cutting edge of life sciences, space and aerospace. Uh, so I, I position uh, clean energy and within that hydrogen in particular as one of those great opportunities. And this panel, uh, most of the people on this panel are far younger than I am. Uh, but those of us um, of my generation remember the enterprise revolution that a conservative government fostered on the back of the deindustrialization of the United Kingdom in the late 80s. And I think we're at the start of that sort of phase in terms of our economic prospects. And one of the things that cleverer economists than me will remind us of is that North Sea oil was fundamental to kickstarting some of that economic growth. And I see in hydrogen 
Uh, and we've got to be careful not to uh, get too carried away. But I do see in hydrogen many of those same antecedents. The UK has a competitive advantage today. Others see the same opportunity. So as we turn out from all resolutely agreeing with ourselves about the opportunity that hydrogen presents, uh, we've also got to be a little bit sharp elbowed because this isn't going to be an uncontended opportunity. Other countries, other states, other markets are going to see the same opportunity. And it's therefore going to test us in terms of how we bring that opportunity to market. Now, one of the things I learned, I'm, I've spent 27 years in business. Um, and as Nadim knows, my sojourn into uh, politics and government is relatively new. And one of the things that the modern British state has to grasp when we look at industrial policy is how we make horizontal agendas, and hydrogen would be an absolute example of that, work well in pursuit of policy objectives. So how do we make sure that as we seek to invest in infrastructure, that at the same time we're able to foster hydrogen-friendly infrastructure investment? When we look at transport and moving our transport onto a more sustainable footing, this government's making huge investments in public transport and infrastructure. But how do we make sure that we're doing that with a view to creating industries of the future? So at minimum, when we're procuring buses, we should be doing that on a technology neutral way. We shouldn't be charging down after electric or charging down after hydrogen. Those are, those are things that we can let the market to a degree duke out and compete for. But we absolutely should be doing that with a view to what the role of, 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 of that procurement exercise is. Government is a spender. Government spending, I suspect it uh, concerns some of us, but it's spending nearly 45 pence in every pound of the national wealth at the moment. So let's make the most of that opportunity. That is a huge convening power to actually start to foster industries like this. So I'm hoping to hear from Joe, who's been a pioneer in this industry and has, uh, it's wonderful. I mean, we should absolutely celebrate um, that we're able to potentially create hydrogen buses and export them to the world. Uh, but we're not going to do that if we sit here and forever talk about that. We've also got to have a bias to action. Uh, and I know the minister and his department um, are ferociously good at this. You know, at our best, um, we're, we're all really, really good at uh, getting behind these ideas. We have a prime minister that wants to get on and do and has a bold and ambitious uh, vision for the United Kingdom. So I think, Emily, you've convened this panel at a brilliant time and that over the course of the next 12 months, possibly over the course of the next 12 weeks, we could make real progress on some of these things. And I hope you'll consider having us back in a year's time to mark that progress and then set ourselves new and even more ambitious goals, because this is going to be one of the most valuable markets in the world. Clean energy is on everybody's lips the whole world over, even uh, nations that are industrializing for the very first time. And wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it make us all proud? Wouldn't it be worthy of the prime minister that we got elected last December if on the back of that, we are spawning multi-billion pound companies and the most important KPI of this government now, creating hundreds of thousands uh, of hydrogen, clean energy friendly jobs. So I'll leave it there because we're going to hear from uh, both Robert and from Joe uh, more about how we translate that marvellous big outsize opportunity into practical policy measures that certainly myself and my colleagues who are just at the start of this journey can try and help the minister put into practice. Thank you, Andrew. I, uh, I will send out a calendar invitation for autumn 2021 for us to reconvene and revisit. Um, Robert, I will come to you next. And, uh, yes, ho hopefully uh, re reconvening in person. Um, yes. So I am. Uh, so I mean, the 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 essay question is, is is what is the role for hydrogen? And there are two um, bit aspects to that. There is the um, the economic role, and there is the environmental role. So I'm sitting here um, behind a in, in front of a picture of Margaret Thatcher, the co-founder of the CPS, who was also the first world leader to sound the alarm about about global warming. Um, 
we, you know, the, the net zero target of 2050 has been set. Um, we have had significant success in uh, decarbonisation so far um, via the, uh, the transition, primarily via the transition from coal to to a blend of wind and gas. Um, but you know, that's that's pretty much uh, we've kind of reached the end of that road. Um, we are, um, you know, the next stage of decarbonisation. Uh, you know, the transport is now the biggest single contributor to. Um, to, uh, to the emissions in the country, and then um, you know after that you're going to have uh, domestic heating. And as previously alluded to, a hydrogen can help with both. So I'm slightly trespassing on Joe's terrain here, but as we set out in our report, hydrogen, you know, the, the physics work w well for hydrogen. You know, what electric, you know, the the, te the Teslas and electric cars are you know are, are doing are progressing extremely rapidly. But the physics, you know, the the bigger you get, the harder the physics gets. Once you start getting to trucks, lorries, trains, buses, ships, planes, that kind of stuff, it just gets very very hard to make it work. So we think, um, you know, we, we think there's a role for hydrogen and the, the, the heavier end of the market, the, the government's bringing out a decarbonizing transport uh, paper alongside the, the heat paper, which will hopefully uh, address this. And um, and obviously, as as Joe will probably say, um, new buses are a great bridgehead on this. Um, the other advantage of hydrogen is that it is, um, it's more compatible with our existing electricity infrastructure. Um, also, no, it was already in transport infrastructure in the sense of you know it's like petrol. You you drive into a you drive you know you drive into the into the station. You put a you put a hose in your tank. You fill it up. You know you you're done you're done in about twenty seconds. It's you know it's it's it, it's kind of it, it does much less much less train you required. But if you're driving a bus back and forth across the city all day, it's it's probably a, a better system. Um, the other benefit, as I as said, is is economic. Um, now um, you know um, and again. The, the, I, Probably trespassing on Joe's train here, but you know, okay. you know, the, the this is not a market yet which has been kind of captured in the way that, say, battery technology has has by China. Countries around the world are putting huge amounts of subsidy into hydrogen, but it, the the race isn't going to be won by the con the country that does the biggest subsidy. It's going to be won by the country that creates the biggest market because. Creating the biggest market, as we've seen with wind power, is what allows you to drive down the costs of these technologies through scale, through innovation, through investment. It's what allows you to kind of create this virtual circle where it's always getting cheaper, the market's always getting larger, and you end up, you know, driving very, hopefully, very rapidly towards a a, um, a sort of cost equivalence. And in fact, hopefully, we, you know, we, we think, you know, there, you, currently, you know, much hydrogen that is produced is not actually um, that eco-friendly, or at least it requires some. Um, your carbon capture and storage to to come along, but if you've got you know if you've got yeah. all the wind turbines churning away, then one of the things you can do with that is, is use electrolysis to turn those um, to turn that into hydrogen. And so I think there's a there's a huge opportunity here for the UK, um, but we need to we need to get it uh, get it right and um, and prime the pump and really push towards getting that kind of towards getting those kind of getting the scale right, getting the um, Getting the costs down, and hopefully it will. Be, it will, like wind or solar, become one of those stories where, where you know, in in twenty, in ten years' time, even we're looking back and going, my God, how incredibly cheap it is to do this thing, and how did we ever, how you know, how did how did it ever take so long for us, us to do it? Thank you, Robert. Um, I was worried for a moment there that we've lost the true expert on on the panel, but he seems to be back. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Joe to give us a to give us a real view from the coal face. I'm so sorry. With all this chat, my phone is overheated. So there we are. <laughs> so uh, why hydrogen? Hydrogen is something I have been looking at personally for about 15 years. Um, and actually, when you come to zero emission solutions, uh, for me, the most difficult thing to change is human behavior. Um, uh, the reality about it is if we can find something that fills up our vehicle in the same manner, costs the same and does the same as what we do today, I think you'll get mass adoption. Uh, and hydrogen is the solution that does that, as far as I can see. Um, now, at the moment, it's a little bit more expensive, but with a bit of volume, I think we can get the cost base down. As we're coming out of this COVID crisis and as we're coming out of Brexit, um, we have the opportunity as a country to, um, uh, you know, have a few strings to our bow. Um, um, Andrew Gipper said earlier, uh, there are a number of things that we're very, very good at as a country, but we can't be all things to all men. And when it comes to zero emission, there are two zero emission solutions, batteries and hydrogen. When it comes to batteries, China have done a brilliant, brilliant job. They have 73% market share. 
And any time in business when someone has 73% market share, it's incredibly difficult to knock them off their perch. What I think we should do with hydrogen, however, is what China did with batteries 10 years ago. So China uh, decided to get into batteries and created a domestic market for batteries and battery vehicles. And by doing that, they got the lowest cost base in their home market. They also at the same time drove the supply chain to come into that market. So now China has not only 73% market share, but they own most of the supply chain, uh, including the, uh, the chemistry and the minerals, and they have the lowest cost base of this, and therefore they can go and export that around the world. When it comes to hydrogen, we have lots of wind in Britain, and we have lots of water. Uh, those are the things that you can actually make green hydrogen with. And if we can therefore make green hydrogen, then we need to start getting it going as prime movers. The difficulty with hydrogen is, is, is this simple difficulty. How do you marry up supply and demand? Because you see, if I can make hydrogen, that's great. But if I haven't got a product to uh, put that hydrogen into, uh, I, uh, I'm not going to bother making the hydrogen. And vice versa, if I have a hydrogen vehicle, but I haven't got any hydrogen, we, we can't really do both of them. And um, the minister's team is brilliant in Bayes, and they have seen this as a wonderful opportunity. However, the transport department does need to catch up on this because the two need to be together, supply and demand. Um, now, while I've been looking at hydrogen, the other thing is, as a country, we could start saying, who are we going to compete with? So after over the last six months, the French government have announced up to 12 billion for hydrogen. The Germans have announced 9 billion. And my sort of view on it is, it, this is absolutely fantastic and brilliant uh, uh, for the world of hydrogen. But it, if we don't get it going in Britain, I'll have to go and live in Germany. And I frankly like living in Britain. And I like being very British. So I don't really want to go and live in Germany at this point in time. Um, but we can do it in Britain in a cheaper way and get it going. Remember the Chinese example. Um, where does hydrogen start? Well, if you really, really focus, where does supply and demand cross over? Um, that's where it starts. Now, I focused on that, and I know people would look at me and go, oh, he's into manufacturing. He, he's really interested in buses. Well, yes, I am in, uh, interested in buses, but I'm really interested in how do I deliver hydrogen to buses? And buses is being the first use case. And the reason why buses are so good as a first use case is this. If you have 200 buses going home to a depot, uh, you have uh, demand. And if I have demand, I can make production. The other thing about buses is there's a lot of them. So if you start with trains, you might maybe buy 10 or 20 trains a year as a country. That's great. But then you can't go back up the supply chain and get the cost base of it um, down. So really what we're trying to do at this point in time is how do we get not only the supply chain, the cost down of the supply chain, but also the cost down of the hydrogen to get to a point where it can cost the same as our incumbent. And once it does, then we can export that around the world and create lots of jobs around doing this. And this is why the focus has been simply at this point in time on buses. Um, and that is the starting point for hydrogen. But hydrogen is something that we as Britain have an advantage of at this very particular time and this moment. You roll forward six months to a year and these other markets will get going. Um, even China have decided to stop funding uh, batteries and they're now funding hydrogen. So I think in my opening remarks, if we can focus on how does hydrogen and you marry up the supply and the demand, because once you've got the production ready, you can apply it to every other part of the market, trains, ferries, all the other parts of the market that are not quite ready yet. Buses are ready, trains come in in 2022, ferries around 2025. The hydrogen planes you might have seen, Zero Avia have just announced their hydrogen plane. That probably starts coming in in 2026, 2027. And when you start talking about hydrogen for heating, you talk about that coming in properly commercially around 2030. And actually the great thing about that is the cost of hydrogen for hydrogen for heating is around £1.50 a kilo of hydrogen. Uh, you're comparing natural gas. The equivalent price of running a, a, um, a bus on hydrogen is about six pounds a kilo. So when people say it's expensive, it is if you start at the case of hydrogen and heating. But if you start at transport and you go down the cost base over the next 10 years and marry them all up, we can get it going and get, get all of those jobs in our country. 
There are a few areas of technology we don't have here, but if you were to get volume going, they would come here. Two or three of the manufacturers of um, hydrogen fuel cells have said, look, if you give us a volume of 10,000, we'd move our factories in Britain. Well, wouldn't that be cool? Because that was invented here in 1840. We invented fuel cells here. We've lost them, but we could get them back. Um, these are just things that I think we could look at and try and drive our economy over the next number of years. Thank you, Joe. Um, I have to say, it's, I've done a few of these events and I don't think I've ever been on a panel which has actually had such a positive and exciting outlook from all of the participants. Um, I think that's hugely exciting uh, for us as a country. Um, if I could just pick up on a point uh, that Joe raised there, which actually ties in, I think, with um, some of Nadim and Andrew's earlier comments, which is about this supply and demand dilemma, I suppose, and, and how we marry them up, given that it, it's spanning multiple government departments. Is this something that's being looked at um, in the hydrogen strategy um, or is it something that, that more work needs to be done on? Uh, perhaps I can ask you, Minister, for your views. I certainly think that uh, the Hydrogen Council should address this issue. I think it's an opportunity uh, from what we're hearing uh, from Joe. Uh, and I think, it, it, I think that what my takeaway uh, from this uh, is that you know, we're not doing this um, in isolation whilst the rest of the world sort of you know, hangs back. You know, we are in a competitive environment with other uh, developed uh, countries. Um, Joe mentioned Germany and France. Um, but as he said, China themselves are doing, uh, you know, looking at hydrogen very seriously. So I think it's important, it's incumbent upon us, I, I would say, to look at uh, the UK, one of the most difficult things for us in the United Kingdom, and it's something that, that um, I'm grappling with, not just in the energy sector, but across the sectors I cover, even including in life sciences, by the way, is, you know, do we really have the capacity to build businesses uh, that can scale? Right. And, and a couple of weeks ago, I got the regulators in and said, look, let's have a meeting and I sort of the, the 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 title of the meeting was regulators for growth because I think the regulators have a a, a role to play in post COVID world to help the economy grow further. And one of the exam questions that I've set them we're going to have regular meetings. The PM uh, is very engaged in this with this agenda. Is of course that regulators are independent of government. The one thing they did say, by the way, was one they've never had this done before. They haven't they haven't been brought together before in this way. I don't know if that's true, but that's what they said. Two, they said, actually, we want to understand your strategy because then we be, we are able to regulate in a better way. Plus, post uh, leaving the European Union, we can be much more agile um, at the way we do regulation. I got the health regulator to do a sort of show and tell for, for all of them as to how they behave to get dexamethasone into the NHS or the little you know, gadget from Mercedes, which saved thousands of lives that people didn't need to be ventilated. But I actually think we need to, you know, it's incumbent on us to, to work across government and across departments to say, hold on a second, if this needs pump priming in the way uh, Joe is describing in terms of demand, um, you know, one, are we able to do that? Two, you know, if we're not, why aren't we doing that? And it's not about picking winners. It's not about picking you know, Joe Bamford's company versus somebody else's company. It's about the, setting the strategy and then the broad direction of travel of what levers are available to us, whether it's in hydrogen or equally, by the way, in defence. You know, I've got similar conversations in, in defence as to how do we continue to make sure that we you know, inject innovation and the tension of competition whilst also growing the industry uh, as well. So I think though it's absolutely, the simple answer to your question is, it's incumbent upon the Hydrogen Council to address this issue of you know, what are the levers available to government and as uh, Andrew quite rightly reminded us, you know, at the moment, government is about 50 percent of the economy. Uh, pump priming seems like a particularly apt turn of phrase uh, for this discussion today, I have to say. Um, Andrew, I think you wanted to come in. Oh, Andrew, we seem to have lost your audio. It's back. It's back. User error, not uh, <laughs> nothing too uh, worrying about the technology, I'm afraid. Um, first of all, I wanted to uh, agree and commend with the minister because I think those are exactly the right initiatives. Th there is a question about how much money the government should be putting in as a fiscal stimuli. But I do tend to think that is the smaller part. It's not zero, um, but it's the smaller part 
of government's power of ability to, to drive outcomes. One was going back to that government as a procurer. I mean, if we think about buses, let's be honest. I mean, the government is is funding every part, particularly now, but even at the best of times, the government is effectively putting all the money at the top of the supply chain, sometimes directly, sometimes uh, using market mechanisms. So, so there's a lot that we can do on that. As we leave the European Union, uh, we'll have new tools in the government procurement armory, uh, and we can use those more smartly. But there's also the, the leadership and convening role of government as well. Now, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll describe Whitehall charitably as a work in progress to drive some of these horizontal agendas. Uh, but there's also a role for us as, as politicians um, and, and as thought leaders to talk more. A lot of the barriers still on hydrogen are psychological. I mean, I have driven a commercial hydrogen car. It exists right now. It's not something that we should be talking about as coming down in the future. Uh, Joe's absolutely right that one of the best places for this to start is effectively the the, the larger, more commercial sector. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful to have hydrogen powered river buses plying their trade in the major rivers that run through most of our great urban centres and which were built on the back of those great rivers in the first place? That, if nothing else, would be a huge exercise in raising the awareness, both of the benefits in terms of net zero uh, emissions to the population, but also just raising awareness um, for, uh, for, for, for civic leaders uh, and, cor and, and corporate life. So I think, I think there's lots of different things. There is a piece about how do we you know, lay down the very significant amount of money that, for example, we spend on basic science. The UKRI budget is absolutely phenomenal as an amount of money. And we are committed to doubling that over the life of this parliament. So, again, I think a lot of it is because because I'm, I'm looking at Robert and he's going to keep us all very honest in terms of fiscal discipline. Um, but I actually think if we're choiceful, there is a huge amount of capacity that we can bring to bear to foster the sector anyway. Lovely, thank you. Uh, Joe, would you like to come in on, on some of those points? Well, unfortunately, for some reason, I didn't hear anything of Andrew. He was uh, lovely, <laughs> um, making, making lots of uh, noise. Um, look, I, I heard Nadim, and some, some of the things I could say is this. Uh, the government have already announced 4,000 zero emission buses. Uh, there are three bus manufacturers in the UK, and they already make um, hydrogen buses. Now, if half of those were... Um, uh, hydrogen buses, uh, we would have probably one of the largest economies in the world. Why does that work um, well? Well, it works well as this. I'm making hydrogen. Uh, we have a factory. Uh, we're just connecting a very large electrolyzer, which is a system that makes hydrogen from water. And we're connecting it to a very large offshore wind farm in Kent to deliver hydrogen into London. And, you know, you take water, you put a bit of electricity into this membrane and you hit water and it spits the water into hydrogen and oxygen. We put the hydrogen in a truck and we deliver it in London. We fill up the bus in seven minutes and the bus does everything that a diesel bus does. We make battery buses too. A battery bus will do 60% of the distance of a diesel bus and take uh, four and a half hours to charge. Whereas a hydrogen bus will do 95% of the distance today and take seven minutes to fill up and it could be 100% green. But if you gave us 4,000 as a singular manufacturer, 3,000 buses, let's say you gave a singular manufacturer 3,000 buses, at the end of 3,000 buses, we could get the bus to cost the same as a diesel bus. And then we're at parity. Already we can deliver hydrogen for the same cost. And there were a few things that helped that. And unfortunately, they're not in... Uh, Nadim's area, they, they are actually in the Department of Transport, but there's something called Bus Service Operator Grant, where we incentivize bus um, um, operators to move to cleaner diesel. Well, if you made hydrogen a fuel under that, you would get the cost to cost a similar thing, and you don't really actually change a lot and have to put a lot more money into it. There's something called the Renewable Transport Fuel Obligation. Now, as I've gone through making this, the Department of Transport has made it even more difficult to make hydrogen rather than made it easier. And they've made 
meant that I can't go to any wind farm in the UK. I have to go to a brand new one. Now, if they put the additionality clause back in, that would actually speed up the process. These are a few of the things that we can get down in the weeds uh, and look at it. But the real point, I suppose, is you have to start somewhere and we have to get going quickly in one area. Because once you get going in one area, then you can go up and down the supply chain and incentivize those people to come into, into, into Britain. And look, manufacturing is something that's very close to my heart. But manufacturing doesn't happen in capital cities. It happens in tertiary towns. And once you have it there, it's there for 50 years. We have an opportunity to get different parts of this supply chain into Britain. And we have all the opportunities of doing that. You think about it, one of the most expensive things is hydrogen tanks. I know they sound a bit dull and boring, but they are quite expensive. Well, they're made out of carbon fibre. We have most of the Formula One teams in Britain. Why can't we get them to start pushing into those sort of areas? We have skill sets that are very good at this. But once you've got going, it's all about the improvement of it. And you've got to get going. And if other countries get going in one area before us, then going along the supply chain is going to go into those countries rather than here. And let me, let, I mean, this is a, a bit over the top, but uh, here's a thought. Um, there are eight and a half thousand filling stations in the UK. If you made 50% of it, if, you put it, if the government said, right, we're going to put um, 4,000 filling stations as hydrogen filling stations in the UK in the next two or three years, Toyota and Hyundai, who make hydrogen cars, look, would you come and make them in Britain if we'll make um, the hydrogen production facilities for you? Now, I, I, it's a conversation I'd have with them. I mean, I'm not, I'm not in government. Uh, I'm pushing buses plus hydrogen because I think that's a great solution. However, um, you know, people like Hyundai, people like Toyota think that this is the future of vehicles. They just need a market to get there quicker than other markets. And we, if we create it here, they stay here because they're manufacturing. Manufacturing doesn't move very easily. And if you get the lowest cost base, then you can export that around the world. I think it's um, it's really uh, telling that you picked up on the collaboration point because that seems, uh, I think if we look at some of the, the the nice things that have come out of this coronavirus crisis, there aren't very many silver linings we can look for, but the collaboration between different industries and the willingness of people to come together to tackle such a major issue um, has been has been you know lovely to see and i think if we look ahead to our next major issue which is climate change and achieving net zero i i, I see where you're saying in that that can we make this a force uh, to go in that direction too um i i think i, I just want to to make sure that, that we do remember when we talk about achieving net zero um one of the the points about hydrogen is also the air quality um which i think is something that um we well i know that i have earlier on when full lockdown started, you could suddenly look outside and, and things weren't all uh, covered in smog. Um, but Robert, as I know, uh, you live in London, you have two small children who have to travel to and from school. Perhaps I could just bring you in to, to talk about air quality and, and hydrogen a little bit as well. Um, sure. Um, and so, so I, I should just say, first off, I, I am very, I should have mentioned this in my opening remarks. Um, it is good to hear that the, the government is getting behind hydrogen in a, in a big way. Um, I, I think also this should happen with all CPS reports that we publish uh, something and then uh, we are arguing for a calling for a hydrogen strategy. And then within weeks, the government announces that, yes, it will have a hydrogen strategy and do lots of other things which are in the report. So um, uh, very, very happy with that. Um, so oh, yes, on the air quality point, I mean, we, we, um, uh, we escaped... Uh, you know, before uh, before lockdown actually came in, we we we, um, we, we I, I took the kids out to my to, 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 to my grandparents, and we all sort of um, hid away from each other nervously for a week. And you know, my son, my son's asthma just disappeared. Um, he was having an inhaler for coughing, and suddenly he wasn't. And it was you know, his school is is kind of by a couple of rail lines, by a main road, and um, it was really it was really noticeable. Um, I mean, air quality is one of it's one of those uh, those huge issues. Um, I don't have the statistics. Uh, to hand, but yeah, it's um, you, you, it is what it is a it is a great thing. It's a killer. It, it um, impinges on quality of life, and it's something that people are really concerned about. It can be very hard to get the public on board with green stuff because, thanks partly to Extinction Rebellion and their friends, they tend to now think that green means expensive and nannying and intrusive. Um, and but the, but but there are kind of there are things which which get them engaged. Air quality is one. 
green green manufacturing you know, new manufacturing jobs in 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 the in the north of England and other neglected parts of the country is something which really really gets them. Like you know, um, you know, you, it's all, the, the, the green is almost parenthetical. They just like the idea of a kind of a new and you know, the, the, a new kind of industrial revolution. So on the um, on the equality side, I think you know the, the beauty of hydrogen is is you know for those who aren't familiar with the physics, it is you know it's a, it's just you know it's just H, and you add the O, and you get H two O. You know there are no there are no particulates, there are no um, there are there are no, there's nothing that, that comes out of the pipe, and um, you know it's a it's it's it is it is a very good. Um, it is a very good solution, and um, and also actually sort of longer term. Um, one of the disadvantages of battery technology is that it, you know at the end of it you have a battery which is a lump of lithium and other kind of quite nasty stuff which you can't really recycle very well. Um, so actually, so over a kind of lifetime, sort of if you're going into that kind of circular economy um, territory, hydrogen um, hydrogen hydrogen does um, does win out on that front as well. I'm I'm very conscious that I don't want to hog the conversation because we have a massive flurry of questions uh, coming through. Uh, so first off, uh, from Tone Man, um, will the government start encouraging or paying offshore wind to generate green hydrogen rather than paying them to stop generating? Uh, Minister, would you like to, to have a go at tackling that one first? Without wanting to, to preempt the energy white paper or the hydrogen, <laughs> but clearly uh, Boris Johnson gets this. You know, we could be the, I think his quote was, we could be the Saudi Arabia of wind um, uh, and energy generation from that. Uh, how do you link that? Well, hydrogen is perfect for both um, offshore wind uh, capacity and, of course, nuclear, because uh, nuclear will play a, a significant uh, role in our energy portfolio, whether it be uh, large nuclear or SMRs, which are exciting and a lot of the innovation happening in the UK, or AMRs, so sorry, small nuclear, and then um, uh, the, the real sort of technology leap, which is uh, looking at uh, these modular, uh, almost factory built, the AMRs, uh, and of course, ultimately fusion, um, where again, we lead the world um, in terms of uh, technology and innovation. Uh, but all of that lends itself to green hydrogen. Uh, and once you've made that sort of investment, uh, uh, I think it's incumbent on us to begin to think about the, the demand side, as I think Joe is urging us to do, you know, you know whacking us over the head to do, uh, uh, rightly so, um, uh, because you know, you're talking about uh, you know, many, many, many billions of pounds of investment. Now, you've got to learn the lessons because you know, we've done phenomenally well with offshore wind, 36% of this Earth's energy offshore energy production is now from the united kingdom and we want to grow that even bigger but the lesson from that is you know we've also grown a giant business in northern europe brilliant a couple of giant businesses actually not just one uh, wonderful for them but i'd like to see some of those businesses being grown in the uk uh, whether it be rise hydrogen or other companies uh, and again you know, it's not my job to pick winners but it's my job to create the the the, the, the sort of the rules of the game uh, and the, the 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 levers I have available to me, whether to create demand or to uh, make the investment possible, um, uh, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, should we be looking at contracts for difference for hydrogen? Um, you know, that that is exactly what we should be thinking about. Massive opportunity, I think, uh, for us. Not because I think you know because of the innovation and what we're doing around R and D and you know, going up from to shy of 11 billion a year spent 22 billion a year and therefore there's a real op opportunity to, to back some new innovators but also you know geographically uh, i think i can't remember whether joe or, or robert said this you know we've, we've got phenomenal wind and water uh, and it would be you know it would be a, a crying shame to come back here to you whether a, a year or four years from now and say oh well we've missed the opportunity yeah absolutely we're not going to do that we're, gonna, we're not going to miss the opportunity. Good. That's exciting. Um, I've got a question here from Richard Katz, which I think Joe will probably be best placed to answer. Um, Richard asks, what risks are there that are associated with hydrogen in the national pipeline and how can they be addressed? Well, by the national pipeline, I mean, uh, I would assume this means uh, hydrogen for heating in the gas networks. 
Uh, look, there are risks involved with anything, anything in this um, in this space, um, and it's how you mitigate the risks. Really, um, uh, therefore, look, the pipelines would do uh, do need replacing, uh, and will need replacing to take hydrogen here. However, hydrogen. Um, hmm. Actually, hydrogen used to make about 50% of our gas networks um, back in the 1950s. Um, in reality, town gas back in the day, every town used to have a gas works and town gas used to be about 45% hydrogen. I'm a slightly dirty process of doing it, but actually we did have it. I think you can now only inject into our gas grids today about 2 to 3% of it could be hydrogen. So that is an opportunity going forward. Um, so I, I think that's a, a great opportunity going forward. Um, I just want to quickly just say um, the one of the, and I'm just going to go back to here, a slightly change the subject, it, the practicalities, and I think this is one thing that we just need to think about, on when you talk about batteries and uh, the electrical grid, which is the other alternative, as you spend the next 10, 15 years um, doing more and more of this, I think you start running into some problems. The practicalities of rolling out um, electric vehicles, they're great at small bits. You can plug a few of them in. But when you start scaling them up, you start having real big problems. So, for instance, here's the thing. If you would like to do all the cars in Britain uh, on um, charging stations, great, it's absolutely possible. Uh, you'd need to put in 2,100, 2,200 filling stations, you know, charging stations every day between now and 2050. Just think about that from a roads point of view, how many roads you would have to dig up. And that's with today's charging technology. Now, when you start going, well, oh, tomorrow I'm going to have a faster charger, so I'll do it again. These things will start becoming problematic. Let's say a filling station on a motorway does 1,000 cars an hour. Um, now, today, the fastest charge time is half an hour right well that's great that means you're parking 500 cars for half an hour that's if you've got 500 super capacitated chargers if you have 500 super capacitated chargers you need enough power to do maybe 25,000 houses all at the wrong point on the grid it, the scaling up of electrics are fundamentally more difficult than people think they are and we're trying to make solutions that don't quite fit whereas i think hydrogen where you make it a wind farm on the coast, uh, you put in a truck and you fill it up. Most replicates how we uh, move fuel around today. And just on the wind farm side of it, wind farms like it. They're going to have to make investments in a non-subsidized world over the next 30 years. What do they do when they've got no subsidy at two o'clock in the morning for their wind farm? Well, great, they can turn on my hydrogen production kit and make hydrogen. That's another great solution here as well. So I think there's a lot of things going for it. And I think whoever's bold enough as a country to really push and jump into it is a, is a country that's going to have a winning solution for 100 years. This could be a Shell or a, a BP for the next 100 years um, and pay people's pensions, hopefully, for the next 50 years or 60 years. Um, thank you, actually, for bringing us back to cars, because that segues very nicely onto uh, this next question I've received, um, which is, do we need to look at the role of the tax system in helping to nudge decision making towards more sustainable outcome? Uh, for example, a broader carbon tax or higher fuel duty would make hydrogen relatively more competitive with fossil fuels and stimulate markets in it. Uh, potentially a divisive question. Uh, Andrew, are, are you feeling divisive this afternoon um, i don't think i don't think it should be de decisive i mean we should look at the role of the tax system all the time i mean it's a massive intervention both in individual people's liberties uh, but also the economy uh, in fact the the least likely prospect of all is at this particular moment in time we've arrived at exactly the optimal tax system uh, and therefore, it should be diligent on all conservatives uh, to, to be restless in, in looking at at all times. Um, we should also clearly do so only only when the presumption um, is set fairly high. So um, I won't get into the, the details of the specifics. I'm sure the questioner knows more about them than, than, than I do anyway. Um, but I would I would look at market based mechanisms um, on, on carbon, for example, I mean, the UK has the best capital market in the world, to my mind. It's got the best rule of law. It's the place where so much global business uh, is transacted. It's the home of the global maritime um, industry, even though 
uh, let's be honest, the port of London these days uh, does rather less business than it did uh, 100 or even 200 years ago. Uh, we were always the biggest trader in gold. Uh, and again, these shores are not abundant uh, with gold as a commodity. So I would love to think of as a global market for carbon, uh, which I think undoubtedly will exist, that the UK seeks to um, build a strong position, if not the, the leading position, uh, as the home of trading carbon uh, as we try to decarbonize the commodity, the, the world. And therefore, that that ability becomes itself a precious and tradable commodity. Uh, and then there are there are things that are more accessible in terms of the tax system, like looking at research and development tax credits. And, and I always think, unusually, we, we should look at the tax system through two axes. There's, there's the rate, the headline rate, uh, that as Nadine will know and, and Joe will know, is not necessarily the, the take home rate that a business particularly pays, because that's a function of where it, it is in, in the cycle. And secondly, there's the ease of paying taxes. And we do, as, a, as an economy, we do pretty well on the headline rate of some of our taxes. Uh, if you look at corporation tax, the biggest tax, 19% uh, is, is very competitive. Um, and indeed, arguably, if you're really honest, there's a little bit of scope to remain competitive uh, if that was set at a slightly different rate. However, the UK tax system, and notwithstanding the brilliant progress that's been made actually even over this COVID crisis, it's not just business that have innovated faster. HMRC, to give them their credit, have done a brilliant job uh, of innovating. Um, and, and I think that that's taught us all something. But historically, the ease of the tax system in the UK was not that, that fantastic. Uh, and there is a consultation, I believe, the minister will know better than me, still ongoing about the research and development tax um, credits, because it was very geared to buying things, you know, a big tangible thing. If you bought, a, for example, a big computer server, which let's face it, no one does these days, that attracted tax credits. If you transformed your business and put that same capacity in cloud-based server technology, but meant that there was no longer an asset for you to own, accessing that tax credit wouldn't be as easy. So we're not going to turn this into a detailed tax seminar, but, but I think the point is we should always be strident in making sure that our tax system best serves our economic ambitions and secondly, there's a, as much to do on the modernization agenda as there is on the actual rate agenda. I, I would say if we're talking about possibly turning this into a tax seminar, I have to let Robert yeah. come in on this question. <laughs> well, I'll just be very quick because um, we're, we're running, running out of time. But I mean, the obvious answer to this is, um, you know, is, 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 is the, 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 free, the free market approach is not to distort the market by, by taxes, but we should ensure that, those, that the tax system takes account of, of externalities. In, in, uh, you know, that's why one of the things I really like carbon pricing uh, as, a, as a model, because it kind of basically tries to, you know, it's the sort of minimally distorting uh, way in which you, 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 you shift the economy. Um, road pricing is also something that, that we're looking at, um, particularly as a, you know, as, as fuel duty, you know, as, as, it, as the revenue from fuel, fuel duty, duty sort of drops or drops on a cliff. You know, it, it, it's not a case of privileging, like uh, picking winners on the technology. It's a case of ensuring that, um, you know, the, the, the technologies which have zero emissions attached, attached kind of, you, that you sort of reflect that um, by working out the kind of, um, you know how how much more advantageous that is going to be. I've got a, a great uh, question from Alexander Large here. Uh, he says it's clear that hydrogen has a lot of potential, but what specific policies would the panelists like to see implemented uh, in order for the market to develop? Read the CPS's report. <laughs> That's one option. Um, but uh, Joe, would you like to answer? But I will also come to Andrew and Nadim and Robert to see if they have a. Uh, specific views about where they would like to see things go next. Um, Joe. Uh, well, when it comes to policies um, to, to make the market develop, whatever policy there is, we need to use, um, you know, if there is subsidy, like the wind industry has had subsidy and now has come off subsidy. Subsidy actually by its very nature is not brilliant for businesses. It's great to get us to a point where it costs the same, but as quickly as possible, me as a businessman wants to get off subsidy as well because it sets you up to have bad habits. 
but I would use subsidies today to do it. Reform the um, bus service operator grant. We we spend six hundred million quid a year as a government um, on getting people to uh, getting bus operators to move to diesel, which is kind of silly. Um, reform this renewable transport fuel obligation that helps us going. The CFDs are great, uh, but it'll take us about two years probably to get through all of that. The renewable transport fuel obligation and BSOG are things that you could do today. Um, look, just to say quickly, we, you know, if the government took the money um, to do the 4,000 zero emission buses and financed them plus the infrastructure like the trains they do in the UK over a 15 year basis, we think we are about at the moment 20% more expensive without really any subsidy on a per mile basis um, uh, than diesel. And we do everything the same. So if there's a bit of subsidy, we've got to just drive that cost down. Once you've got it going in our area, then you can get it going in other areas. So for instance, Ferguson Marine, which went bust in Scotland, or um, Hull and the Wolf, which, um, which are a shipping company and, uh, um, um, that makes uh, boats. You know, the Scottish government owns 48 ferries, for instance. Hydrogen ferries are going to come in. If they just said, right, look, we own Ferguson Marine in Scotland and tell you what, we'll put a tender out for five hydrogen ferries and Ferguson Marine entered for it. Woohoo, you've saved jobs and you're also the number one fer hydrogen ferry company in uh, a country in the world. These are things that are within your gift to sort of uh, marry the two up. Anyway, that's my bit on subsidy. Thank you. I'm, I'm conscious that in three minutes uh, we're going to be cut off. Uh, so I will ask the Minister for, for his closing thoughts. Uh, thank you. Just, Alexander, very quick answer for you. I think uh, the way CFDs have worked on offshore wind, you know, when we started the process, it was, uh, I think, £140 per um, uh, megawatt hour. Uh, the last set of contracts, we let out uh, £38, £39 per megawatt hour. Massive, massive um, opportunity, I think, in hydrogen uh, to do something very similar um, uh, in terms of policy. Uh, I think the important thing is to get that hydrogen strategy out, get the, obviously, first of all, the energy white paper, which lays out the roadmap to net zero, get the hydrogen strategy out. And more so than policy, than anything else, uh, Alexander, is implementation. Uh, you know, the greatest challenge for government is implementation, uh, whether it be the you know, large infrastructure, uh, which very much talks to this agenda as well, uh, or scaling up some of the really good interventions we're making with SMEs like Made Smarter, which we did in the Northwest uh, of England as a pilot with a thousand companies to help them uh, get technology into their manufacturing process and raise productivity. Um, I'd love to talk more about policy. I'd much rather focus, let, let's get the strategy and start implementing it because it's the one lesson I want to keep from the COVID um, uh, pandemic is pace, is work at pace and maintain that pace for the next four years. Andrew, any very quick final thoughts from you? Uh, nothing to no look. Nothing to add. I'd only detract from uh, that brilliant summary by Nadim and that very specific set of policy suggestions from uh, from Joe, which I suggest we we get behind if we can. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, all that remains is for me to thank everybody out there for watching. Um, if you would like to find out more or get a copy of the CPS's brilliant report, um, please go to cps.org.uk where you can sign up to our newsletter uh, or follow us on Twitter at CPS Think Tank. Um, a huge thank you to our panellists, to Nadim, Andrew, Joe and Robert this afternoon. Thank you again for joining us um, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your Conservative Party conference. Thank you. Thank you very much.